We're missing one speaker, but I'm, uh, I'm assuming that he's on his way. Oh, here he is. Speak of uh, Nick. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, good evening, folks. Um, I, I feel slightly divided here, and let's be honest, there aren't, there aren't huge numbers in the room. I'm sure there are masses online, but I wonder if I could move, uh, if I could move this row into the middle here, would that be a, it's a very unchurched thing to do, isn't it? You know, make you all sit in the same place as if you liked each other, uh, that's, uh, that, that kind of thing. Well, <laughs> I, I do hope that you don't take that as an abuse of my power as, uh, uh, as chair this evening. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, on behalf of uh, Highland Theological College and the, the uh, Chalmers Institute to our book launch this evening. Um, we welcome all of you for coming out tonight and on Monday evening. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. And uh, let me remember also to welcome those who are, uh, are joining us online. We're, uh, we're here to, to talk about this book, a uh, book that's been edited by the the two marks um, uh, on the stage here, and I will get these gentlemen to introduce themselves uh, in, uh, in just a moment. Um, the book, uh, as I'm sure you're probably all aware, it's why you're here, uh, the book is called Not So With You, Power and uh, Leadership for the Church. Um, a book really about, um, uh, what is it about? It's about biblical and... Uh, 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 <laughs> huge, huge, uh, lasting, unforgettable impact. Uh, it's, it's about the, the, the right use of power and uh, authority within the church, um, a, a book that gives us a, a biblical framework and then some pa practical reflections on the whole question of power uh, and the use of power and authority within, uh, within God's church. And we're going to think about this, this book. We're going to talk about it together with, uh, uh, with uh, four of the authors who are present with us this evening. And uh, I'll interview them, ask them some questions about their chapters, about the, the book as a whole. And then we'll, we'll take a, a short break uh, in the middle, uh, roughly the middle, uh, and then we'll open things up for questions from the floor. Uh, we, also have, um, we also have the opportunity to submit questions online if you're not comfortable asking questions uh, out loud. There is a link which I think is on a slide which hopefully should appear behind us. And that link will give you access to a, a little kind of drop box, drop box thing where you can, get, uh, where you can uh, leave questions and they'll uh, appear as if by magic on my screen. I don't know if a QR code works from that distance, but you're, yeah, it does. Yeah, you're welcome to try. Um, so, um, so that's uh, that's where we're going this evening. Let me uh, also just at the beginning uh, offer our thanks to Alice McLeod, the minister here at CCC, and to the the office bearers here for for making this fine facility available to us. We're um, uh, we're we're very grateful. In fact, it reminds me the last time, the last time I preached here at CCC, um, I, I blithely walked in about 10 past th six uh, thinking in the evening, uh, thinking that it was a good 20 minutes early for the evening service to find that it was a six o'clock start. Uh, so um, funnily enough, I've not been invited back since then. So uh, it's good, it's good to, to sneak my way back in under, a, under another guise. So uh, no, but thank you, Alistair, for, uh, for making us so welcome this evening. Let me pray, uh, and then I'll invite Mark Sterling. Uh, Mark heads up the Chalmers Institute. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave Mark to say what the Chalmers Institute is. Uh, this is actually about uh, the Chalmers Institute is interested in all things discipleship uh, at every level in the church. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, that'll do. 
That will do. And you can explain more about what that, what's involved in that. Mark and Jenny Sterling, have, uh, they, they've moved the Chalmers Institute up to the north of Scotland uh, in order to have closer ties and affiliation with, uh, with Highland Theological College. And we are delighted to have them. <laughs> so most of the time. Uh, <laughs> no, we are. We are delighted to have them. And uh, I'll invite Mark just to, to make some uh, introductory comments about uh, giving a kind of biblical framework for our discussion this evening. But before, uh, before we do, let, do that, let's pray together, shall we? Holy Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you are the God who reigns. Uh, we thank you uh, that you are uh, God of gods and King of kings. We thank you that all authority rests in you. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have uh, perfectly modeled that of authority for us in the, the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that you continue uh, to speak to us uh, by your Spirit. And uh, Holy God, three in one, we do pray that you would uh, lead and guide our thoughts and our conversation this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to meet together uh, to talk about these important issues, important for the life of the church. And we do ask, Lord, that you would uh, speak into our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would speak into our minds. And we ask also, Lord, that you would, uh, that you would move us in our wills to respond to you more fully. And so, Holy God, we give uh, this time of sharing together over to you, and we ask, Lord, that your name would be abundantly glorified, and we pray that you would bring your light and your wisdom to these conversations. And this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So thanks, Jamie, um, and uh, let me extend my warm welcome uh, to everybody here as well. Um, this, this book has been a bit of a labor of love for Mark and for me, uh, putting it together. It started with um, a late night discussion as we reflected on some of the situations we knew personally, just some of the ones that we personally knew, uh, some of the, 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 the difficult situations in churches where leadership has gone badly. For me, this journey uh, starts much, much, much earlier, way back in my 20s, beginning to wrestle with what does healthy leadership look like in the church. And from a biblical, from a theological point of view, th this book is, is, uh, is fueled by a, a central conviction, if you like, and that is that, um, firstly, as, as human persons created in God's image, our vocation is to reflect God's character to each other and to creation. And those who are uh, called to leadership in the body of Christ, that, that, that's uh, supremely the case, that, that the calling is to reflect God's character in the way that we lead. And that means then that uh, if we misuse power, then it's not just the fact that there's a few bad characters, a few bad eggs uh, that uh, are causing trouble, it's not just that we might have governance structures that need to be tweaked or changed or refined, but actually it's fundamentally a theological problem that when power is misused in the church, it's because we have misunderstood who God is and what the gospel is, and we've therefore misrepresented God and misrepresented the gospel to the world. And really, there could hardly be anything more serious than to do that. And part of what we're seeing in this book is that, that, that that's really what it means to break the third commandment, to take the name in vain. It's to take Jesus' name and then to misrepresent him. Instead of representing the God who is eternally full and satisfied and uh, uh, in himself and needs nothing from us, to represent God instead as capricious and needy uh, and like us but bigger to borrow one of Jared Mickelson's phrases that he uses. 
There's one phrase that does run through the the book in various places, which is that we can't do Jesus' work in non-Jesus' ways, and that that's such an obvious thing to say, and yet it needs to be said. Um, The reason that we went for this book, and the reason we put it together the way it is, it's roughly the first half is theological and biblical foundations, and uh, the second half is more practical reflections that arise from that. And uh, we wanted very much to address some of these theological issues. Um, Who is this God whom we represent? What is he like? And how would he have us lead healthily to reflect his character to his people and bring blessing through leadership and the exercise of power? That's probably enough to start with, isn't it, Jamie? More than enough. Uh, Excellent. Jamie's spiritual gift is the word of encouragement. That's it. (laughs) Uh, Sorry, I just left my questions here. Um, Let's start with intros, shall we? Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, because I I probably know 80% of you, so I forgot to introduce myself at at the start here. My name's Jamie Grant, and I'm Vice Principal Academic at um, at Highland Theological College. And you are? I'm Mark Mennell, and uh, I work for something called Langham Partnership, which was founded by John Stott and have co-edited this with Mark. Hi, I'm Nick Mackison. I'm from Glasgow. I'm a fellow of the Chalmers Institute, and I'm currently in my third year of a PhD in New Testament. I was formerly in the Free Church of Scotland as an assistant minister. And Mark, do you want to introduce yourself properly? Uh, I'm Mark Sterling, um, and uh, I uh, teach part-time with uh, Highland Theological College. Um, My wife Jenny and I formerly were in St Andrews, where we were involved in uh, Cornerstone Church, which is now United Free Congregation, and which Jared is now leading um, infinitely better than I ever could, which is wonderful. My name's Jared Mickelson. Uh, Yeah, I'm the better pastor of Cornerstone Church. (laughs) 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 Don't say anything else about yourself other than no. Not much else to say, yeah. Okay. Right, well... What should have done is get us to introduce each other. Oh, that's just a recipe for chaos. So so we're not going to do that. Um, I I don't know how many of you have, have seen the book already. Probably probably not very many. There are copies available for sale here at reduced price, and we can accept uh, Contact, no, contactless, contactless payments, payments. Uh, yes. non, non-cash uh, payments. Uh, the, the, I've not read the whole book yet, but uh, I've been through a good chunk of it. It's good reading, uh, and there's a lot of good content here. Uh, effectively, we have 15 chapters, uh, as Mark was saying, divided into two parts. Uh, the first half of the book, more or less, is made up of biblical and theological foundations uh, surrounding the whole idea of, uh, of power and authority and the use of power and authority uh, within the church, both uh, uh, analyzing that both positively and negatively, uh, analyzing that the, in, in terms of uh, the, the, the biblical frameworks and, uh, and also looking at, uh, at some of the some of the aspects that we miss uh, uh, along the way. Um, the, the mix of contributors, a mix of academics and, uh, and practitioners, not that academics are not practitioners, I hasten to add, to academics and folks in pastoral ministry uh, of one, fort, one sort or uh, another. Uh, and the themes, as you'll see, just through, as a quick scan through the book, the themes vary from textual discussions, for example, of uh, Philippians 2 um, uh, and other uh, grounding passages in the Old and, uh, and New Testament, through to the impact of uh, the Trinity and, uh, and Trinitarian fellowship on, uh, on uh, our understanding of leadership and authority roles, through uh, sin and things like symbolic capital. I may well ask you what symbolic capital is uh, uh, along the way um, to questions of mentoring, um, brokenness within the church, um, empowering women, and, uh, and all sorts of uh, uh, practical ramifications of the, 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 the use of power um, within the church. So 
What I'm going to do is just read some, some little excerpts from the book uh, along the way and then direct some questions in your direction, gentlemen, if that's okay. They have seen these questions before, I hasten to add. Um, so it's not, uh, I, I'm not being quite that cruel, you know, as, uh, as it might sound. But anyway, let me start with uh, a, a paragraph from the acknowledgements that you write, uh, uh, Mark. Um, the book is the fruit, uh, this book is the fruit of years of conversations. In particular, I need to thank the scores of survivors who have trusted me with their stories of hurt and devastation. They are the brave ones. This is but a small response to their suffering in the hope that others may not be forced to endure what uh, they did. Uh, so I guess just on the back of that, Mark, wh why this book at this time? So I, I, th there's been a spate of these cases on both sides of the Atlantic. Some of them have actually hit the secular press and been on the front pages of newspapers and even you know, made a focus of Channel 4 news and things like mm. that. Um, so um, these issues have been around in the church for, well, since for 2,000 years, mm. but they've come to the fore in recent years. Um, and one of the things that both Mark and I had noticed in our conversations a while back was that actually there, there's some great books coming out that are written from a particularly psychological or psychiatric perspective, and those are really helpful. But one of the things that I was conscious of was that there are some people who would dismiss even examining this subject as being, I don't know, for want of a better word, woke or just getting on a bandwagon or just listening to the world or whatever. And, and these are just a, a, a bunch of people who are just disrupting or undermining gospel preaching and, and, and so on. And so if, if that is where people are coming from, they were never going to read something by a psychologist if mm. they think that that whole sphere or approach was really irrelevant or uh, at best. So what we, we realized was that there are not many people writing theologically and biblically about some of these things, uh, as well as just the sort of pastoral experience that we get in church life. So it's not, you know, we're not psychologists, we're not trained counsellors, but actually individuals have come to us over the years that you think, actually, this is not just, this is terrible, but this is not the only person I've heard this from. And that there is a, there is a pattern here. Um, so how are we going to get the wider church to really engage with these things mm. um, and not just sort of brush it away under some sort of label that makes it easier to dismiss and say, no, that actually this is fundamental to being Christian, let alone Christian ministers. Mm. Um, and so we had to try and then find ways of proving that actually this is, has been a central issue of the scriptures from the very beginning. Um, and so that's why we were trying to draw from different people, <laughs> many of whom actually have read some of those important, helpful psychological books um, that have been, been coming out. So we are sort of coming together, but it's just saying we need to show that this is really important for us as well. It's not a niche thing. It's not a sort of um, abstract thing. This is a very real thing. Mm. Um, so in some ways... A lot of this stuff, we should have been talking about this decades ago. Sure. Yeah, absolutely true. And it's clear from some of the anecdotes that you, uh, that we, we read, that we encounter in the book, that the, the, the need is very real and, and very pressing. Uh, and also that some of the, um, uh, some of the quite deleterious aspects of the abuse of power are also quite hidden. Yeah. Uh, and difficult to spot. So um... not only hidden, but actually, um, other people enable those abusers because people are naive or mm. don't want to look. Sure. Yeah. And so they just get to carry on. Thanks, uh, Mark. Mark Sterling. We've got a glut of marks in my life at the moment, <laughs> but uh, anyway. Um, 
so you were, you were just saying in your brief introduction a moment ago that, uh, that, that kind of the key theme of the whole book, and it, the, in different ways it runs through the, the various chapters that, uh, 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 that, that I've read. Um, thank you, sir. Um, we, we can't do Jesus' work in non-Jesus ways. Why not? Yeah, uh, and it's, it's a question that, that in one sense should answer itself. Um, and it's a question that's designed to get us thinking, to what extent do we try to go about things in ways that aren't like Jesus? So I, I spend the first chapter in Philippians 2, which very much describes Jesus' way. And Paul says we are to think the same way as Jesus. Um, and particularly to think that way, the way that he did about his equality with God, which he saw not as a means to get something for himself or to defend himself against something, but rather as the means to serve and to give. Um, the the cross-shaped life, if you like, that, that uh, giving of self, the pouring out of self for the blessing and benefit of others. Um, and if that's the pattern then it means that any reversal of that, the, the use of power, the use of privilege or leadership or position to get something for self is by definition a misuse of power. And it's not just in that passage in Philippians that, that Paul says, this is what Jesus did and this is a good idea. Paul says, this is what Jesus did. And then he uses Isaiah 45 to say, and this is the supreme demonstration of God's character. And therefore, that what Jesus does in pouring himself out in this way is a reflection of who God is. It is the demonstration of God. It's not a departure temporarily from God's character. It's the supreme demonstration of it. So, so if we go about trying to do things in any sort of a different way, we're actually vi we're, we're pushing against the nature of the created order. Yeah. It, and it really is that, that yeah. serious. And, and the trouble is, of course, that that can get us short-term results. It can feel like that we're getting stuff done. Um, and, and the lure of things like um, efficiency yeah. and ease and results and success, I think, can drive us to say there's got to be easier ways. And it's just like, it's, it's like Peter. I, he's just confessed Jesus as the Christ. And Jesus says, this means I'll be, I will suffer, be rejected, die, and then rise again. And Peter says, no, there's got to be an easier way. You, you've got all this power. I've seen you walking on water, calming storms. I've seen you doing these things. There's got to be a more efficient and easier, a better way of doing it. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Mm. So I think that's the, that's the issue. So it does raise quite profound questions for the, the manner in which we judge success Absolutely. Within, I, the, yes. within the church of God. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I mean, I, I would say that, that one of our biggest problems is that we have defined success in ways that are exactly the opposite of the way that the Bible would define success. Mm. Interesting. No doubt we'll come back to this, um, this theme. Okay, to the, both Marks, the editors, I, I've edited a, a few collected, um, uh, collected volumes of essays. I know it's a, it's a labor of love, <laughs> and, uh, and it can be a... Um, an, an immensely frustrating experience uh, at, at times. So let me ask, why, why this group of people and why these topics? Um, we, wanted, we wanted a broad sp spread of different types of people. Different, we, we really wanted it to be quite international. Um, it's not quite as international as we originally planned or hoped, but we've got some voices from North America um, and uh, one writer from India uh, and um, from the UK, across the UK. I think um, there is actually a wide variety of expertise and um, experience brought to bear. So you, you sort of put, um, put out the nets and, and hope you'll get a good, good spread. And I think we did in the end. Mm -hmm. um, there are always sort of others we were really hoping for or didn't quite work out. Um, but I think... Um, I think there is a genuine diversity there in terms of what's um, being addressed and what people are talking about. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, 
we're really pleased with how it sort of came out in the end. You never quite know what's going to happen. You have a, a plan and it doesn't work, but then this comes out, so that's great. And we also wanted people that we, whom we knew kind of got this issue, understood it, and, and we didn't want people who were, who were just talking heads, sure. just theoreticians. Mm -hmm. you, you wanted some people who actually had, had, uh, had some, perhaps mm -hmm. some scars and wounds to, to uh, show. And, um, uh, sorry, I had a question that I was going to ask you in the back of that, and it's completely gone out of my head. <laughs> oh, themes, that's what I was going to ask you. Did, you. did you guys suggest the topics, or did the people come with their people topics? With expertise, they let, and then, then in discussion with them what they were going to end up focusing on. But we knew that we wanted different uh, New Testament, Old Testament people, so Chris Wright, um, obviously a, a great Old Testament sure. scholar. Um, so we said, right, well, we'll what do you think you, you could bring to this? And, and so he was able to choose. Uh, there were one or two others. So uh, a guy called Steve Wookie wrote a book that I read ages ago that's it's called um, When a Church Becomes a Cult. And he wrote that on the basis of experiences he'd had um, in churches in London. And then um, he was actually very close friends with Jonathan Fletcher, who some of you may have picked up, um, was... A, a significant um, abusive leader in London. Um, I was, I came to Christ through Jonathan. Oh, gosh. Um, and, um, um, and so uh, Steve had known him for, well, well, longer than I had, but I'd, I'd known Steve, uh, Jonathan since I was 18. Um, so writing, we asked him to write 25 years after that book came out, Reflections Looking Back, and the fact that actually he had no idea what Jonathan was up to. Um, and he's someone who'd written a book about the stuff. So, you know, his antennae were pretty sharp to this. Um, so it was actually quite helpful to get his... So we did ask him particularly, and, and um, uh, others as well. We asked specifically for, for things that we knew that they had um, con contributions to make. You, you can't ask for a more diverse group of contributors than that, can you? You've got men, women, Western, non-Western, and a Wookiee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> and that was the plan. Okay, very good. Right, uh, question for... He hates George Lucas. <laughs> I, I, I'll bet he does. And I, I do feel I should apologise for that from the get-go. Sorry, I don't know Steve, but anyway, apologies for that. Um... Okay, a question for everyone, all four. Um, what's, what's, the, the, what's the one chapter of the book that you think everyone needs to read? You cannot say your own chapter, <laughs> and you cannot say the chapter of anyone who's present on the, 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 the panel, um, because otherwise it would become a backslapping exercise. Backstabbing. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> um, What's the one chapter that, that everyone really needs to read and why? Jared. I, I would say, um, yeah, Grant McCaskill's on social capital. And because it's really easy to talk about this in the abstract and to think if I haven't, if I haven't done something absolutely heinous, then the issue of the abuse of power doesn't apply to me. Yep. And that chapter brings it down into the very nitty gritty social dynamics that we see in church and in every sort of human relationship mm. and sees how we can nonetheless be abusing our power even if we haven't done something unspeakable. Mm. Very good. Nick? Um, I'm not going to say Grant McCaskill, even though he's my supervisor. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to say maybe Graham Shearer's chapter on, on love uh, and Augustine. And there's some helpful material in there. Um, which could maybe, maybe be open to uh, some misunderstanding, but he talks about how we use um, people um, to grow in our love for God. So, so our love for people, it, it's not an end in itself. Um, we love people towards the greater end of enjoying God and, and rejoicing in God. And, and what that helps do is situate all of our lives within that wider frame of um, worship and, and enjoyment. And when you think about church, you know, often the church itself becomes preoccupied with subordinate goods. So you might have something like, you may be pressed upon Sunday by Sunday that, you know, you need to be involved in personal evangelism. 
And I think personal evangelism is obviously an important thing, but you know, it, it can displace the, the, the major key of worship. Mm. You know, we're coming to church in order to learn how to enjoy the triune God. Um, we have been brought into his presence through the death and, and resurrection of Christ. And our whole church experience should be an education in worship. But a lot of the time, you know, we hear the major key, um, you know, now by these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is evangelism. You know, we, we <laughs> and so we, we, we carry this burden um, and, and rather leaving the company of God's people enthused with the greatness of God, we, we leave with guilt. You know, I haven't spoken to so-and-so at work this week. I'm, I'm a failure of a, a personal evangelist. You know, I've not, um, I've not discipled effectively, etc. And so these good, proximate, subordinate things become all-encompassing. And we forget, actually, that we need to situate these things in, in this greater um, arena, if you like, of worship and, and love for God. So I think Graham's article really helps to accomplish that. Mark? Um. I was going to say grants as well, but um, <laughs> let's, let's talk about another one. Um, I, I would talk about um, Blythe Sizemore's called The Cost of Brokenness. So she's a friend in the States, and um, it was really important that we had some voices from people who have survived some of this stuff and processed and worked it out. So there were a number of people we could have asked and indeed had conversations with, but it was too soon for them. Mm. Um, but Blythe is someone who has worked in more than one church and really, she, she really bears the scars, um, but is now at the point where she can talk about it and write about it. Um, so I, I think things like that prove that this is absolutely not abstract. Yeah. And, and what is really scary is when you start sort of raising this kind of thing above the parapet, then, then it's sort of exponential. Mm. People come up to you and they yep. say, um, and so I wrote a book that came out in 2015, which was more abstract and more cultural looking at power and, and stuff. Um, and I was concerned for, you know, it was sort of a polydetics thing. It was called the wilderness of mirrors. And it was trying to sort of figure out why is everybody so suspicious? Why is our culture so suspicious? Why doesn't anybody take anything else, anyone else says seriously? And the root cause actually is, is having your fingers burnt. You stop trusting people because you've been bruised and hurt. And, and that is actually the sensible thing to do. If you've been hurt, you don't put your hand in the fire again. But basically since that, I would say since the book came out in 2015, I would say not a month has gone by without somebody tracking me down somehow online or whatever to talk about some of it. So that, that, these are the, the, the survivors, these are the stories. And so then you realize this is really all over the place and it's real. So let's, let's actually do our best to say, not dismiss it, but listen to what people say. So we've got one or two people who've done that in here. Mark. Yeah, I, I, I would have said Grant's chapter as being one of the... <laughs> the because he's saying something so important for leaders to actually think about and apply. Uh, and actually, I would then have said, or alongside it, I would have said Jared's chapter, because I think it's massively important. Um, but, but I'm going to say that there's, there's a chapter in the second half of the book that's written by an Indian woman, Sushila Ailawadi. Uh, I don't know her, never met her. I think she's a, one of your contacts, Mark. And I, I, it's just about the most harrowing thing that I have read on this subject, or any subject indeed. She talks about the place of women in Indian society generally, um, and produces some heartbreaking statistics. For every thousand male infants that are in India, for example, she says there are 860 females. What happened to the other 140? Mm. Um, and then she says you know, that, that it should be different in the church. She talks about the, the family dynamics, the, uh, the way that women are treated, the, um, uh, the systemic sexual abuse. And she says it should be different in the church, and often it isn't, and gives some examples, which are stunning. And one of the things we felt we had to put in as a footnote in that chapter, and I think it's why it's important, is 
that, that, that it illustrates, I think, a really important principle. That is, that it's easy for us to look outside and at another culture and say, well, that's <coughs> obviously wrong. You know, that's so obviously wrong. How could the pastors that Sushila's husband was training, 20 of them, how could 19 of them think that it was okay to beat their wives, to discipline them, which is one of the stories she tells? And, and, and that seems obvious to us. And the, the challenge, I think, is then to say, if we were able to step outside of our own culture, what would we look in and see in our own culture that others would look at and say, how can these guys be so blind to this or to this? So I think her, her chapter not, not only illustrates this, this massive problem of the way that women are treated um, and, and the way that power is often used against women. Um, and I, I think, <laughs> as an aside, I think the next <coughs> tidal wave of scandal that will break uh, will be regarding domestic abuse in the church. Um, but the challenge is to, to, for us not to think that problems exist out there where they look obvious, but first and foremost to look inside and then to ask for external voices that might help us to see what's going on. Very good. Thank you. There is an awful lot of good content in the book and you're just getting a, a, a flavour of that from the, uh, these comments from the, the gentleman here. Um, Listen, where are we at? Uh, we are at seven minutes past. So let's aim to go until like 25 past, gents. Is that okay? And uh, then we'll take a five-minute break uh, and we'll come back for uh, questions and answers from the floor and from online. So let me take you to your individual chapters briefly. This is the vibe of it. Uh, this is the vibe of it. <laughs> your individual chapters briefly. Mark. Uh, <laughs> I was, yeah. Let me read you uh, the two opening paragraphs of your chapter. The, the idea at the heart of this chapter and of this book is simple. Power and leadership are the means of giving oneself to others, not the means of getting something for oneself from others. Simple to understand, harder to apply. Believers are commanded in Philippians 2.5 to imitate Jesus' attitude to his equality with God. The articulation of Christ's attitude to rights and power in Philippians 2.6-11 is radically at odds with popular conceptions, not just in the world, but also sadly in the church. Leadership must never be the means of self-advancement, self-assertion, or selfish gain. Rather, it is for the service and blessing of others. Consequently, any reversal of the direction from self-giving to self-gain is by definition a misuse or an abuse of power. This is the central theological and practical burden of this book. It's, it's, I'm sure you all agree, it's a, it's a powerful statement. Um, uh, and uh, certainly for me, r reading it at first sight, there was something just um, helpfully contextualizing <laughs> about how we think about the, 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 the use of power. So let me just ask you the general question, uh, Mark. What took you to this text? Why this passage? And what were your, 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 your kind of your main conclusions from, yeah. from the study? I mean, it, it started for me with reflecting on situations I'd been in where I had seen people damaged by, by their Christian leaders, mm. and uh, myself included. Mm. So it started, it started with, with reflecting on situations, thinking, what's going on here, and, 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 and how have we got this wrong? And... Um, and thinking about the question of discipleship, that is following Jesus. And did my master's dissertation on imitation mm. and went to that passage. And so I started digging into that passage in depth somewhere around about 2005, six. And the more I did so, the more I was stunned by what I was seeing and, and how it seemed uh, with increasing clarity 
to be a rebuke to so much of what I had been taught, what had been demonstrated, and what I saw being practiced. And like Mark Menno, I, I found that as I began to teach on the subject, mm. uh, out of that text especially, this steady growing stream of casualties came across my path. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but to say then, and I think this is the, the important thing, that, that, that Philippians 2 is not, it's not about leadership per se. It's just about just normal, <laughs> normal human relationships as God has made them to be. Uh, and so this isn't just about how we use power in leadership, although it applies especially to that, obviously. This is just about how to be human. Hmm. And, and so it, it seemed the more I've dug into that particular text, the more I've been, I've been stunned by the, the upending of so much of what we think of as being normal. Hmm. And, um, and maybe, maybe I've encouraged, I've, I've tried and encouraged others to dream about what life looks like when people actually do treat each other in that kind of way. Hmm. Thank you, uh, Mark. I, again, I had a follow-up there that's completely gone uh, from my head, but uh, it will come back to me I, in just a second. If I can add to that then, that, that trying to lead in that sort of way and lead a church in that sort of way is both exhilarating and extraordinarily painful and costly. Thank you, and that helped me, uh, that helped <laughs> me recover my question. There, there, there's, there, there's, there's something... I didn't read your question, so I know <laughs> uh, there, There's something hugely countercultural about what you just described. Yes. Hugely countercultural. Yes, that's right. It, I mean, it's not how leadership is viewed uh, in the world at large. And my sense would be that that's having an influence on the, the, the church as yes. well. Yeah. Very quick to brush over foibles or, or, or inconsistencies if, you know, there, there, there are signs of success bringing people in or whatever else yeah. it, it, it might be. How, how, do we, how do we challenge that cultural perception that's influencing the, the, the church? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at every opportunity and in every possible way, I think, is, is one answer to that. Sure. Uh, I hope telling some of the stories, calling things out for what they are, um, challenging us to redefine what we think of success as actually being. Um, sure. I, I, I think, I, I think it, it means that uh, what we celebrate as success, this is maybe one of the key insights, is what we celebrate as success and, and reward as success is, is what people will then adjust their behaviors towards. Mm. Um, and. Um, I think I say at one point and in, in maybe another in the last chapter that, that uh, we, we, in our churches, we often love to have leaders who are gifted and get stuff done and make us feel secure because, we're, because we, are, we are the people, we are successful, we are doing well. Um, and it leads to us saying things like, wow, you know, it gives great sermons, but... You know, it's not a very great relationship or he treats people badly. And one of the things I said is we should never, ever, ever, ever allow the phrase, he is a great preacher, but... Thank you. It's helpful. Jared, if we can uh, turn to your chapter, let me again just read a, a brief paragraph here. You, you start us off by, um, by kind of talking through the, the, the whole Mark Driscoll thing in the, the States and the, 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 the Rise and Demise of Mars Hill, the podcast and all the, all the rest of it. And then uh, again, a, a paragraph that made me uh, stop to think. Uh, in what follows, I want to suggest an antidote to the toxic potential of every Christian leader to abuse, to abuse their power and office. While Driscoll spoke a great deal about theological truth and error, the irony is that his ministry was theologically deficient with regards to the doctrine of God. And this is just as true for many, even, for many evangelicals uh, across the theological spectrum. And a little further on, uh, uh, you, you write, Jared Driscoll and many evangelicals implicitly and unintentionally articulate an insufficiently exalted high, uh, uh, sorry, an insufficiently exalted view of God and correspondingly of Jesus Christ. 
To put it plainly, the problem is not, uh, or at least not merely, that their Jesus is not nice enough. Their problem is that their vision of God is too small. A transcendent vision of the triune God is an indispensable component in avoiding king-like figures who model their ministry upon Jesus in the wrong sorts of ways. How so? Why so, Jared? Why, why a, a, an inadequate view of the doctrine of God uh, and, and what are the, the, the Trinitarian implications for them? Um, yeah. Thanks for making through reading that paragraph. It now sounds really poorly written now that you said it. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So I think, I think, yeah, poor editing. I think uh, if we want to guarantee that no one, no pastor, no Christian leader ever thinks that they're guilty of the abuse of power, the easiest way to do that is to demonize them and sure. to turn them into subhuman, all of them toxic narcissists who are just... Uh, obsessed with control. Um, I think to take this problem seriously makes it, and to, to bring it a lot closer to home for all of us who, like me, are in Christian leadership. Um, when I was listening to the Mars Hill podcast, and I talked about my own story, having been, like a lot of young men my own age, liking Mark Driscoll uh, to a degree as a young man, um, one of the things that really struck me, and it's something that uh, I think you see replicated in a lot of stories of, of pastors or leaders that abuse their power, is that they often feel in themselves that they are constantly under threat. They feel that they are on the verge of losing their power. They feel that everyone is against them. They don't feel that they are strong, powerful titans kind of pushing people to the side. They feel like, I'm barely keeping this church together. Everyone is against us. And if I have to hurt a few people for the greater good, then so be it. And so part of what I try to talk about in that chapter is that when, when you see that dynamic at work, you see that part of what funds the abuse of power is actually codependency. Mm. People that become too reliant upon their leader and leaders that become too reliant upon what they get as being the one that can secure the future or success or safety or whatever it may be. What you are basically doing is beginning to love like God. Mm. You're beginning to say, if you love me, I can give you absolutely everything that you need. And if you give me, what, 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 if, you, if, you, if, you, if you return that, basically we'll have this reciprocal relationship. I'll get affirmation, respect, accolades. I'll know that I'm enough and I'm doing a good job. And I'll absolutely secure all of the, the future of this congregation or church or whatever it may be. And so what I kind of argue in that book, and I, in that chapter, and I go into detail, which might be too much for this setting, is that when we, we need to spend a lot more time thinking about what it means not to be God and not just thinking about how we should be like God. Now, sure. we should be like God in certain ways, but it is just as important to realize that if I'm a minister, I am not saying I'm the one that can meet your needs. I'm pointing you to someone who is the true source of your needs. And so I'm actually going to have to also say at times, I can't guarantee that the things that we all want, we all want a church that grows. We all want a church that is doing great discipleship and that has great preaching and that great, has great services, but I cannot guarantee those things. And were I to try to do so, were I actually to become too intent on doing everything I possibly can to secure those good things, that's when I start down the path of abusing power because I start thinking I can have a godlike sort of relationship mm. with the people that I'm trying to care for. Thank you, Jared. That's helpful. You, you include a, a, a very thought-provoking quote from Miroslav, uh, Miroslav Volf uh, here. Uh, he, uh, Volf suggests there is a duty prior to the duty of imitating God, and that is the duty of not wanting to be God, of letting God be God uh, and humans be humans. Uh, and in some ways, that, that kind of summarizes uh, exactly what you're, you're, um, you're talking about here. So how does a, um, a properly rounded concept of the doctrine of God help us to avoid these problems, uh, Jared? Sure. So to, to get into the weeds just a tiny bit before mm. we move on then, um, I do think actually knowing the Trinity makes a difference. Mm. And I know that might sound absolutely insane, that when, <laughs> when we think about the Trinity in church, we oftentimes think this is some sort of speculative doctrine from the past that none of us really understands, but we know we're supposed to believe it, so we do, okay? Here, here, here's part of the reason why. 
the Father is nothing but his relationship to the Son and the Spirit. Hmm. There is, this is the classical Trinitarian doctrine put in very, what I'm hopefully simple terms. The Father is nothing but this act of perfectly giving himself over into the Son. The Son is nothing but the act of perfectly receiving that and returning it to the Father in the Spirit. They are nothing but their relationships to one another. The Father is nothing but his relationship to the Son. The Son is nothing but his relationship to the Father. If two humans were like that, if uh, this person was nothing but his relationship to the other and this other person was nothing but his relationship in return, what would we call that? Codependency. For God to be God, that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. For us to have that sort of relationship is grossly unhealthy. We are meant to be more than our relationships to one another. And so cults form when you start expecting that kind of relationship with your church leader, where you start saying, this community is everything. You are nothing but what you provide to this community. And so understanding that we are meant to be loving as the Father is loving and the Son is loving, but to do it in a creaturely way, in a way that avoids becoming codependent, and which says the only relationship upon which we are completely and totally reliant is the only one that can bear that weight and that can be trusted with it. And that is our relationship to the triune God. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Jared. Nick has his thinking about something that we would rather not think about, uh, sin. And the, I'm the, the expert on that. <laughs> oh, I beg to differ. Um, and the seriousness of sin. Let me read you. Uh, I'm a glass to talk about this. <clears throat> I'll ignore that comment. Um, you point us to the, the, you know, the, what the Puritans described as the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Uh, while revulsion in the face of evil is good and necessary, astonishment is uh, not. And one reason why many of us are astonished is because of our naivety. Evangelical naivety leaves the church vulnerable to exploitation where leaders are ill-equipped to respond to evil within the church with the necessary wisdom <clears throat> excuse me, and firmness. If the church is to ward off abuse and protect the vulnerable, it must be prepared to reckon with the implications of a biblical doctrine of uh, sin. We don't like to think of ourselves as naive, do we? Uh, we, we? We like to think the best of people and to assume that everything's going to be fine. But as you point out in the chapter, Nick, that's often not the right thing to do. No, no, it's not. Um, I, think, I think one of the, the great problems in terms of our naivety is, as I said in that chapter, is that it is is the fruit of a, a shallow doctrine of sin. So we, we tend to reduce sin to something that is not a radical corruption of our thoughts and our desires and our actions. We reduce it from that to, uh, you, know, you know, wrong behavior, to wrong action. And so, uh, conversely, um, godly living is right action. It becomes reduced uh, to performance. And so what you have is a, a, if somebody is attending your church and they're exhibiting the right behaviors, if they are, you know, they look deeply moved in worship, they're involved in Bible studies, etc., and, and they're hitting all these key behavioral points, then when we get, let's say this same person who seems to be playing by the rules, then when we get an accusation of abuse leveled at this person, the response of incredulity is, is a real tell, I think, to our uh, shallow doctrine of sin. Because what I think is that while we confess radical corruption or total depravity, if you like, that might be our kind of confessional outlook, but in practice we tend to believe that everyone is a nice guy. You know, the church has magic floorboards so that when you come in, you know, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have the same thoughts about sin that we have, you know, the same struggles, the same um, heart towards God, the same conscience about it, but it's not necessarily the case. 
And, you know, we have to guard against what theologians call an over-realized eschatology. That is, you know, we've got heaven already. That everybody you meet in, in, in church is an inhabitant of the New Jerusalem. And, you know, it's throughout Scripture you see this idea of the covert abuser perpetrating his deeds in darkness. Um, in the Old Testament, for instance, in Psalm 55, David spoke of his constant companion, his, his great friend, whose, whose words were as smooth as butter, but war was in his heart. And we have to realize that amongst our number, you know, there, there are tears amongst the wheat. There are people who are bad actors, who can say the right things and do the right things, um, but, you know, they're, they're hiding something deeply dark. And I, I'm reminded of a situation that I, I once encountered myself I was having a discussion with a church elder and asking him what his reasons were for failing to excommunicate a convicted child abuser in the church. So this, this person had served a sentence for child molestation. Um, he'd been found guilty of it. That had never been overturned in court. But after he'd left um, prison and come back to church, um, he'd said to the elders, I didn't do this. It's a miscarriage of justice. I'm innocent. And so they took him back into membership without any cross-examination. And in that situation, I said to him, well, well, how can you do that? How can you go against the judgment of the court? You know, have you read the court documents? And he says, no, no, I couldn't read any of that. It was far too upsetting. So I said, well, is it, that's the point. You know, of reading that is meant to be upsetting. And so, so what are your reasons for including him in the church? And he said, well, Eric Alexander once said that the mark of conversion is convertedness. And this man shows the fruits of conversion. So there's no way he could be guilty of child molestation. That was his answer. Boiling that down, what he was basically saying was, he's a nice guy. And on that basis, we're going to receive him in. And it's hopeless naivety. It's a, it's, it's a, like I say, it's a, it's a shallow doctrine of sin that assumes that if you're conforming to the right behaviours, then you must, of necessity, be a good person. But I think it also, it doesn't just work itself out in these individual situations, this, this naivety. Um, because you can see, uh, you, we, we believe that, you know, sin is the common affliction or malady of us all. And so sin can affect not just individuals, but it can affect whole institutions. So in the Old Testament, you know, you had Ezekiel in chapter 34 denouncing the shepherds of Israel, root and branch, for devouring the people. They weren't, they weren't looking at, they weren't shepherding the flock, they were feeding upon the flock. And then when you come into the New Testament, you see that same note, Jesus speaking about the religious establishment, you know, in, in Matthew 23, and, and in other places, he condemns the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes root and branch. He doesn't say, there's a few bad apples there. I know some of these guys are good guys and I don't want to tar them all with the same brush, but there's some real bad actors amongst that crowd. No, he says a whole lot of them. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, eh, because you place burdens on men that they can't carry, and you won't lift a finger to help them. You devour widows' houses. He, he, he basically charges the whole religious establishment with corruption, root and branch. It was a systemic institutional thing. So we need to develop, I suppose, a, a realism. We don't want to become cynical. You know, we don't want to look at people and wonder, oh, I wonder if he's a, a dirty wrong one or not, or I wonder if this or that place is a, you know, a compromised place. But what we should be carrying with us is this awareness that sin can rear its ugly head in any quarter, even amongst your heroes, even amongst the people you love and respect, even, you know, yourself. Jared's chapter spoke a little bit about that as well. We're all potential abusers, ultimately. And actually, some of the worst abusers are men with good intentions. Maybe we can speak about that. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nick. You'll have noticed already that I've sp spectacularly missed my time target. Bear with me. We'll ask, uh, we'll ask Mark one more question, uh, and then we'll, we'll take a short break, and then we'll have maybe 20 minutes. We will finish at nine. I promise you that. Okay, so that's the, that's the cutoff. Mid-word, mid we're, we're done. Tonight. <laughs> yeah, tonight, tonight, not tomorrow morning. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mark, I was going to read a quote from, uh, from your chapter, but I've noticed that I've highlighted quite a lengthy quote from your chapter, so I'm going to ignore that. Just that it is a really good quote. You'll find it on page 62. 
if you buy the book. <laughs> so uh, I recommend it to you. Uh, Mark, you are, uh, you are talking about um, the Imago Dei, the, the, the image of God uh, in humanity and its, its implications for the way in which we both think about and use power uh, within, uh, within the church. What is the significance of uh, the idea of the image of God? How does that impact our thinking about, uh, about power and authority? I mean, it's the, the extent of its significance is basically the whole of humanity because it's about um, understanding who it is that we are with when we are speaking with another person. Mm. Um, the, one of C.S. Lewis's most famous sermons he gave um, in the University Church in Oxford, The Weight of Glory. And, um, and what's extraordinary about this, particularly that sermon, is that it was very early on in the war, uh, given, I think, um, maybe even in 1940. So the war was only really beginning to get going. Um, and he's talking about just um, what it means to know that somebody else is made by God and is valued so much by God that actually if they are in Christ, they are a new creation. And that they have the potential to be um, what God always hoped for them to be when we were made. And, you know, he has this extraordinary section about describing, you know, if you could see the person next to you on the bus or in the queue uh, uh, at Tesco's or wherever, if you could see them as they really are, you would think you were in the presence of, of a God. You would be tempted to worship them. That they are just the most extraordinary thing, you know, creature in creation. And, and yet that's all of us. But when somebody is abused, one of the first questions that people, you need to ask is, well, who, did you th who do you think this person is? Do they exist for your own benefit? Or are you there to serve them? I mean, it goes back to what, what Mark was saying from Philippians 2 and so on. Who do you think this person is? Now, it's, it's significant, for instance, in the history of abolition of slavery, um, you know, Josiah Wedgwood made those famous um, sort of medallions of a slave in chains and saying, am I not a brother? Um, the point is, do you realize who this is? This person is made in the image of God, a fellow human being, a brother and sister in God's image. And yet you think you can treat them as a tool, as a slave, as a use, uh, something useful for your vision. Um, and, and so not only is it about actually understanding who God is that affects how we treat other people, but it's understanding who God has made other people to be. Um, so that's why this is, this is really important. And, and it's, a, it's a really significant sort of diagnostic question. You know, to, to, to somebody who has abused... I don't know, a young woman in the church, maybe sexually abused or just controlled. Who, who do you think this is? Are you really seeing them as God sees that person? If you did, you would never have even, it wouldn't have crossed your mind to do what you did. Very helpful. Right, folks, there are, there are follow-up questions that I would like to ask Mark, but maybe you can ask them. So that then takes the time responsibility off me, yeah. which, uh, which I would be happy about. Now, I know I promised you five minutes, but what can I tell you? I lied. <laughs> uh, let's just take two minutes, stand up, stretch your legs, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kick off with, uh, with questions. Two minutes, folks.
I don't know if that was two minutes or not, but we're going. Uh, so, uh, and... Uh, um, <laughs> that's right, divine chair. Let me start with uh, an easy one. Uh, can you define social capital? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't come this evening. <laughs> and? Go for it. So... This is from Grant McCaskill's chapter on symbolic capital, actually, and social status, to, to, to be sort of strict about the terms he uses. But, but Grant is basically describing what is common to every human community. This happens in every gathering of human persons, that we develop um, things that people do, behaviors that you exhibit, uh, qualities that you accrue, that show that, that show that you are part of this group and they demonstrate that you are a member in good standing. And there are things you therefore do that get you in and get you up. And C.S. Lewis has already been mentioned. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called The Inner Ring, which very much describes this phenomenon. What, what people do when you go into any situation, how do I belong here? How do I get accepted? And how do I get up the ladder? And, and what Grant's argument in his chapter basically is, is, is this. Look, this happens in every human community, whether you like it or not. And you have to be honest and face it. And then he basically develops an argument from Philippians 3 that what Paul is rejecting there is symbolic capital accrual in order to build social status. And Paul is contrasting that with receiving the free gift of the righteousness of Christ. And he's saying, and as, long as, as long as we are pursuing symbolic capital, even good things in the church, and leaders end up policing these behaviors, you know, that, that you belong here if you exhibit certain good things, that gets you in, gets you accepted. Uh, and Grant's arguing we need to be very intentional in deconstructing that in order that people can receive the gift of Christ in its place. And obviously the ramifications of that are massive uh, in, in terms of giving up control in some sense as leaders. Mm. <laughs> they are huge and it's a very good chapter. I, uh, I, again, I commend it to you. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to maybe, uh, do we have any questions from the floor? We've got a few more here online. Anyone want to be, yes. I can't, we can't, you're just all blurs out there, so, uh, is it Steve, Stephen, yeah, go on. So, you talked about stories like this that you've encountered, different experiences you've had, you might be at times get angry at these, how do you stop yourselves from becoming self-righteous, sitting mm. in your response to this, thinking that this doesn't affect you, your, over all these other situations? She's sitting four to your left, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how did the rest of you in that case <laughs> avoid becoming self-righteous? <laughs> did, did you submit a similar question online as well, Stephen? Oh, no, so somebody else did. So it covers, somebody asks about the plank in your own eye. Yes. Repeat the question for the live stream. Uh, the, 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 the question was essentially revolving around how do we judge uh, in questions of uh, use and abuse of power and authority without in some sense becoming censorious or, or, or self-righteous uh, our, our, ourselves um, in that sense? And somebody online has asked a very similar sort of question uh, regarding the, you know, how can we see the plank in our, in our own eyes? So that's why I asked for sure. Yeah. So thoughts, gentlemen, anyone? Well, one interesting thing about the, the, the category of social capital is how helpful it is for these things. Mm. So, you know, for example, you might think, oh, yes, a church that has a problem with social capital is a church where whoever goes to the prayer meeting, those are the good people. Sure. All the people that have a very religious exterior experience, you know, outlook, those are the good people. And so to combat that, the good people in our church are the people that are always hanging out in the pub and that have lots of non-Christian friends. So in other words, you've just switched the social capital. You still have just as much problem with social capital. So it, when you start viewing it in those terms, I think the biggest danger is to think that this is, as you were hinting at, a problem for someone else. This is, and, and I'm now going to develop my own social capital by being hyper aware of any potential abuse of power and by abusing who I consider, in other words, to be very fair, 
pharisaical, to be the best at calling out the abuse of power and there, thereby hurt another group of people. So there is with that social category, social capital category, I think doesn't let any of us off the hook. And to go, you know, Mark was joking there, but I also think once you recognize that capacity in ourselves, realizing that we all need really good accountability, mm. people that know us, that can speak, speak into our lives. Um, yeah, maybe that's mm. obvious, but in so many of these cases, um, it seems like there's a, in, there's a formal set of accountability. In theory, sure. there's an ecclesiology with elders or a presbytery or whatever it may be, but in practice, there's one uh, man or woman, usually a man, that is untouchable. Mm. And that's actually quite a strong theme in your chapter, Jared, the whole idea of, you know, sp speaking these truths to ourselves as potential abusers of power. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's, that's something that, uh, as you were saying earlier, Mark, we're, we're quite happy to think about it over there and with them and elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, preaching it to our own hearts is, is perhaps what we need to be doing. Can I add something to that? Yeah, go on. I, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that, that, that really emerges from a lot of the stories that Mark and I have discussed, and I've also discussed with the other guys, is, is when someone is unknown, uh, and uh, especially if they're on some sort of pedestal, uh, that's a particular feature of Highland uh, Presbyterianism, actually, uh, and, and it's, it's incredibly bad for ministers and for people. Sure. So, so being known not just known, but known in a way that people can really speak truth to our lives, because we won't see it ourselves. Sure. Um, let me take another one online here, and I'll, I'll maybe direct this one towards yourself, um, uh, Nick, because you uh, comment on this in, the, um, uh, in your chapter. So if a pastor, after reading this book, recognized that they had not been Christ-like in their use of power within their organization, uh, would you recommend public repentance, for example, Mark Driscoll? Um, have you seen or heard of any examples of this? Now, you've got an interesting section about repentance and restoration in, in your chapter, um, Nick. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it depends on the level of abuse involved because, you know, we have a I think part of the our naivety of sin um, is reflected in statements like, "Well, we're all sinners. All sins, all sins are the same. Um, you know, there's no one sin worse than another." Um, but that's not really reflective of the biblical material. You know, Jesus spoke about the law having weightier matters. Um, you speak, you know, you've seen Ezekiel. You know, when he's been taken through the temple to see the the defiled rooms in the temple, and you know, the Lord says to them, son of man, do you see these abominations? Well, I'm going to show you worse abominations than this. There is a, a gradation of, of sinfulness, which I think ref, um, relates to the impact of these sins, the, you know, the consequences of damage. So I think, you know, if, in terms of pastoral restoration, um, it would really depend upon the nature of the abuse involved. So, I wrote in the chapter about what about pastors that are quickly restored to the ministry after being caught in some, you know, sexually compromising situation. And I was speaking in that situation that it is actually another example of trivialising sin to rush a pastor back to the ministry. You know, it trivialises the damage done to the victim. Uh, it makes her think that this was just a... a you know, it was just a behavioural issue that needed to be corrected so that he could get on with the more important task of preaching the word and leading the flock. Uh, she was just an obstacle to his, you know, fulfilment of his pastoral vocation. And so it trivialises what she went through, I think. Um, but I also think that, it, you, know, you also ask yourself, well, why, why, does, why does the church need that individual anyway in the first place? Now, this is the, the question that I'm raising. I know that this is not a, a widely um, held view, but that if a pastor is involved in sexual predation of those under his care, it's my personal conviction that he should never return to the pulpit. And there's a variety of reasons for that. 
Um, you know, he's, he's basically run roughshod over his ministry vows. He has um, exploited his, the power dynamic that's involved, the power imbalance that's involved between a pastor and somebody in the flock. Um, but I also think that it, it broadcasts this idea that God needs this guy. No matter how bad he's behaved, no matter what he's done, no matter what damage he has um, inflicted on the body of Christ, he is so indispensable to the triune God that we need to get him back in that pulpit. Um, you know, as Jared's chapter tells us, and you, know, you see it again and again in Scripture, no one has ever given to God such that God is in that person's debt. God is eternally full. You know, no one's, he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. So it signals all the wrong things, that God is so needy that he needs this desperate reprobate back in the pulpit. And I think, I mean, Jesus said, you know, that the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own than are the sons of the light. And, you know, we wouldn't put an alcoholic back in the bar. We wouldn't put a convicted paedophile in charge of the youth group a repentant one, I should add. And nor should we put somebody who has demonstrated his inability to exercise godly, self-giving authority in, in his church. Um, it's, it's a, like I say, it is a, a shallow doctrine of sin. And it also, I think, um, signals a, 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 an idea that sin can be managed. You know, if he just goes through these various processes, that will deal with it. You know, these, these little, you know, accountability sessions that we put in place and these little behavioural corrections that we institute, that will rectify the problem. And it's almost as if we're constructing our own, you know, atonement structure, ignoring the fact that sin needed, to, needed the death of the second person of the Trinity and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the institution of the church. It needed all these things in order to deal with the problem. And we assume that our own little kind of um, programs and, and, and restorative techniques will be enough to manage the situation. So, short story long, I apologise, mm. Jamie. That's all right. It, it was one of those uh, sections that I was reading that really made me stop and think about what I think. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's, that's one of the great things about this book. It will provoke you to think about what, what you think. Yeah, question from the floor. Interesting. Thank you. We will take that as a challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, shall we repeat that? Do you think I'm going to repeat that? Um, uh, that's very good comments, uh, partly about, um, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Accountability naturally inbuilt into many areas uh, of life in the private sector and so on, performance, um, uh, all of those kinds of things, partly about hierarchical leaderships between ordained and lay uh, leaders within the church. And the, the third comment was really around deference and, and, and perhaps uh, an undue deference um, uh, towards the leader. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, so, so that 
yet we're, we're, we're meant to look up to our leaders biblically in that sense, uh, meant to honor our leaders, but does that lead to an un, undue deference? Uh, the question is, do we think things are going to get any better um, in, into the future? Briefly. I, I just realized I'm the only person not ordained on the Senate. No, you're not. Which is great. I'm not. No, you're not. Oh, well, anyway. So um, take that back. <laughs> there's, there's something particularly toxic about, you know, if you like normal power structures, and then you add in, God told me. Mm. And, um, well, that was the element, sorry, that I forgot to mention I, there. That's the bit I picked up particularly from what you were saying, that, that how much that mm. can be misused. Uh, and obviously there are things like uh, plural leadership that, it, it, if it is genuinely plural, um, that, that should at least help be a guard against that. But um, there is no substitute for leaders who are actually genuinely humble mm. and acknowledge that they might be wrong mm. and often are wrong. Uh, once they start thinking they're always right, uh, we're, we're really in trouble. That's very helpful. Um, I think one of the things I keep coming back to in my mind is that, um, believe it or not, there was a church in Corinth, and if there can be a church in Corinth, there can be a church anywhere. Corinth was a horrible place. And it was a rough place. It was a tough place to live, but it was also a place that had delusions of grandeur and was desperate to be as impressive as Athens had been five centuries before or whatever. So it was full of all kinds of sort of social issues. Um, it was a double port city, all this sort of stuff. There was a church there, but boy, was it a complicated and messy church. But Paul still writes to them as brothers and sisters, even though that they wanted him kicked out and and so on, but he still sees them as God sees them. That's amazing. So he perseveres with them. Um, uh, the church reflects all the issues of the city, and you can see them manifesting in the Corinthian letters. It's a church that probably caused Paul more heartbreak than anywhere else in his ministry, and he had a lot of heartbreak. But there was a church there, and God raised people up there. And so I think... Um, I keep coming back to the fact that God will raise up the people he needs to do his ministry his way. And in every generation, there are going to be other presenting issues. So I, I'd be thrilled if this is a tiny sort of piece in the jigsaw of actually making sure that this kind of stuff doesn't happen. I hope it does in a little way. Just a few people who read this and say, okay, I am determined to root this out. Um, you know, read Jared's chapter and you think, oh, okay, I see this in myself. I'm going to make sure I'm not going to do that. And, and so praise the Lord if this stops more people being hurt. And, and, you know, that is certainly a genuine hope and ambition for this. There's going to be other stuff. And maybe the culture is going to become more hostile. And, and that's going to put tensions and pressures on the church. But the thing is, God will raise up the people that are needed for that. So my confidence in the end is that we're part of a kingdom that doesn't shrink, that God will raise up the people it needs, and uh, we're going to completely screw up all the time. But God is, in, God is on this. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. We've got five minutes. We're on the clock here, people. Yeah, Dougal. There's actually quite a lot of chat about that in the book in, uh, in, in, one, uh, in one way or another. Um, and what is a minister? Minister yeah. means slave in Latin. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's front and center in Mark's first chapter uh, as well. Just this idea of, of the complete inversion of how we, we view um, authority roles. Uh, within the church, uh, and that they are, that the, the call to leadership is a call um, to a kind of healthy self-giving. I think is uh, is more or less uh, what you're, you're you're arguing for there. That it's not for the uh, accrual of uh, of gains, but um, for the the benefit of others. Um, okay, no, I'm not going to ask another question. I wanted to end on a positive note. We do have a we do have a so we end on a positive note. Okay. 
But they have to be one word answers. Otherwise, we're not going to be done by nine. Okay, uh, can you paint a positive picture of what a church can look like when the common issues uh, with abuse of power are being guarded against effectively? Messy and inefficient. Oh, thank you. Three words, sorry. That's all right, I'll, I'll allow that. Messy and inefficient. In inefficient, especially. Yeah. Um, this will need unpacking, but I'm going to say it anyway. Safe to sin in. Oh, okay. Very good. Yeah, well, uh, transparent. Transparent. Oh, a good word. Yes. Jared, no pressure, dude. Yeah, I was, <laughs> was going to say a mess as well, but you stole that one. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would just say it would look dissatisfying dissatisfying to everyone because you've given up the utopian illusion of perfection and you've chosen people okay. over product. Okay, very good. Excellent. Paul Hoffer's book, Live Together, yeah. says exactly that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, folks, it is 8.58 and we're done. Okay, let me pray for us and uh, we can close and uh, do come talk to the guys. They're not, uh, they're not rushing off and they don't bite very often. Um, Can you tell them how much the book costs? Uh, well, the recommended retail price on Amazon is somebody... 26. 26. But for you, 16. 16 pounds. Deal. Bargain. Take two. Give, give it to your friends. Are we extending that to the people online? Yeah, if they want to get in touch with us, we can do that. We might, we might need to charge you for some postage as well, but yep. that, that, that would cover it. So if you're watching online, just uh, go onto the HTC website or the Chalmers Institute website. Use the, the, the generic contact address there. Uh, tell us that you were watching and you would like a copy of the book, and we'll, we'll get one to you for the same price. Okay, let's pray, folks. Holy Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of great grace. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that even although our sin does indeed abound, uh, your grace abounds all the more. Help us, uh, Holy God, just to look to you, to your nature, your character, your being. Help us to remember those things that are priorities for you and to make sure that they are priorities uh, in our hearts and our minds and in our life together. Holy One, we pray. Thank you for your presence with us this evening. Thank you for your continued presence with us uh, as we go from this place. And may your blessing rest upon us, we ask, in the name of Jesus and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. We're done. Uh, do come and chat to the guys.